Which was more common? In Guado, the male was more common. But in a female? In a female, female was more common. Incorrect. All right, he has passed his exams, honestly. Hello again. Today, the topic is going to be hernias. Comes up all the time in exams. And you may think it's boring and you know all about it, but there are very specific things they want. So we'll go through it today. Okay, let's get started. Mo, you are a first aid consultant and a 55-year-old gentleman has been referred to your clinic from the GP with a bulge in the left groin. How would you approach this patient? So uh, in my mind, this is probably an inguinal hernia. I'm going to go introduce myself to the patient and ask some pertinent questions, mainly whether or not this is symptomatic in terms of pain, bowel obstruction. So ask the patient if there's any episodes of vomiting, bloating or constipation. And also want to assess the impact of this on their quality of life. Um, most patients, uh, most hospitals can't treat these patients until they have a uh, documented effect of the hernia on the patient's quality of life. I also like to ask about how the size has been growing over uh, a small or long period of time. Obviously, that's subjective to the patient themselves. Um, it also want to ask them about risk factors in terms of any surgery that might impact uh, surgery, such as smoking, diabetes, immune suppression, um, and whether they had this previously treated. Uh, before is this a recurrence or not? Um, I think that's it, really. And any drug history that of, that is of relevance, and also what their social history is in terms of their job, whether there um, there's lots of weightlifting or there are lots of manual labour involved. Excellent. So lots to unpack there. But first of all, before we just de deconstruct what Mo has just told us, what's the definition of a hernia? So a hernia is a protru abnormal protrusion of abdominal contents. Uh, through natural or unnatural um, defects in the abdominal wall. Excellent. So you, in, in all of the, the stations, irrespective of what the topic is, you are going to need a phrase that makes sense to you, that's well practiced, but also comes across naturally. What they don't want is a textbook answer that you've, you're, you're rote memorizing and you're just saying out loud in the exam. So it's going to be something that's in your own words. Ultimately, the key points here is the a hernia is an abnormal protrusion through an orifice of abdominal contents. Excellent. For our purposes anyway. Of course, there are other hernias in parts, parts of the body. Now, let's talk about the examination. So the first thing you're going to say is you're going to perform a thorough history and examination. The history that we've already highlighted is talking about specifically the symptoms related to the hernia. So impact on quality of life, bowel symptoms, they're the two main important ones, how long they've had it, the duration and interference with daily activities, especially if they're a builder or manual laborer of sorts. And then you want to talk about the general medical history and any existing medical conditions they may have, the drug history, the social history, such as smoking, heavy lifting, their BMI, that's very important, we'll come on to that later. So ultimately, what you, the answer you want to give is, I would start off by performing or undertaking a thorough uh, history and examination. The salient points being duration of the symptoms, the impact on quality of life, any bowel symptoms, and any other symptoms they may have from it, and the interference with the daily activities. Then I'll ask about their medical existing medical conditions, the drug history, allergies, social history, including smoking, their profession, as well as uh, calculating their BMI. Okay, so we've done the history and we're satisfied that this patient is giving us all the relevant information. 55 year old, is a manual worker, has a bulge that's consistent with a hernia from what the patient reports. It's impacting the quality of life and their profession. What are you going to do next in terms of examination? So, um... In a clinical you will say you will stop saying so at some point to start the sentence, but just not today. In a clinical setting, I'd like to call for the patient to walk into the examination room, so examine their gait, examine how well they support themselves. Uh, it's also kind of a rough guide of how well they'll be able to recover post surgery. Um, examining them, I'd like to inspect the abdomen with them standing up, look for any obvious bulges or protrusions, any previous scars. And also, if there's an obvious hernia, I still examine them standing up, palpate it, try and push it back in and ask the patient to cough to confirm the location uh, and the nature of it. And then we can move on to difference, whether it's an inguinal or femoral hernia, but for the sake of time, uh, it, most of, most examinations, it's not usually that sensitive anyway. Which was more common? Inguinal in a male is more common. But in a female? In a female, femoral is more common. Incorrect. Inguinal is still more common in females. 
It's just females are more likely to get femoral. Well, cool. It's all right. He has passed his exams, honestly. The more the commonest uh, risk factor for developing guanal hernia is being male. And uh, it's around, and it's common in one in every three men. And eventually one in three men in their lifetime will develop an inguinal hernia. Excellent. So just to recap, examination. You're going to examine a patient walking in, their general status, are they short of breath at rest? Do they generally look well, unwell? Uh, do they look overweight, pallor, jaundice, etc.? Unlikely, obviously, in this scenario. But these are things to keep in mind. Then they're going to focus on the abdominal part. You're going to look at the general abdomen, any previous scars they may have had. Have they had previous surgery in the area? Is this a recurrence? And then you're going to look at the bulge. Is there one on the other side? Is there an umbilical hernia? Does it go into the scrotum, inguinoscrotal hernias? Because these are all going to be important factors that you're going to consider uh, when you come to, invest to investigation and treatment. Then what are you going to do with the groin? So, standing up first? How do you so I, my practice, I examine them standing up first, the whole thing. So uh, palpate the hernia, palpate the neck of the scrotum, palpate in the scrotum as well. As well. The standard medical school teaching, try and isolate the hernia from the scrotum. If it's in continuity, then there's probably congenital hernia that's been left. Um, but also you want to assess reduction. And more importantly, especially in the large inguinal scrotal patients, especially in the complex patients with the high body, with the large body habitus. If you reduce the hernia, that's reducible. Do, are, do they, are they able to catch the breath or not? Excellent. So lo again, lots of really good points. Ultimately, what you want to say is these are the, the kind of bullet points that you want to make sure you cover. You want to palpate the hernia and note the location and the size. Does it go into the scrotum or not? You want to try and delineate, although clinically that's not as relevant for the purpose of the exam. However, they do like you to try and determine if it's indirect or direct. Of course, the repair is the same, irrespective, and it can be quite difficult to tell clinically anyway. And it makes a difference to the repair you do. But uh, ultimately, if you're in doubt, it's likely to be indirect because the vast majority of them are in males and females. So you're going to note the size, the location. Does it go anywhere else? Is it tender? Is it reducible? Uh, and if it's reducible, does it suddenly become short of breath? Is there likely to be bowel in it? These are the key things you want to look at. The skin over, uh, over, over it, is it warm? Does it look erythematous? It's unlikely in an elective clinic type scenario, but it's things that you want to point out. Okay, so you've examined the patient, you are happy that this is a reducible inguinal hernia. It doesn't descend into the scrotum, but it's still quite large. He's mildly tender, but a bit of discomfort. He's got no other incisions anywhere else, and he's got no umbilical hernias. What are the options that you would like to discuss with the patient? So uh, I'd like to counsel the patient for operative treatment. We can also caveat that by saying there is the option of leaving it and not treating it. However... Okay. Um, as per the watch and wait trial, you can, uh, there's a 50% chance, there are more than 50% chance for symptomatic inguinal hernia to require repair within two years, within a fo long follow-up period of five years uh, in a large cohort of patients. What was the trial again? I can't remember, it's the name of watch and wait. It's, it was the basis for the watch and wait yeah. uh, practice, essentially. Excellent. Okay, so ultimately, in all of these scenarios, irrespective of what, what the topic is, you're going to outline all the options available to the patient, even though you think the patient may have one or the, should have one or the other. They're going to say this conservative and surgical management here. Ultimately, you've got to use the words, you've got to use the first person, I. So you can say the options are conservative versus surgical management, and I would counsel the patient on both of these. However, in my practice, I would offer this patient surgery because of, and you've got to give your reasons. And in this case, it is clearly uh, a symptomatic hernia uh, that is interfering with quality of life. And as Mo very rightly said, there is a high chance that they're going to need to repair at some point. What guidelines are we going to refer to? British Hernia Society guidelines yes. or the European ones? Actually, the last one, last international hernia guidelines now, that came out in 2018. Which is almost a copy and paste irrespective. Which, follow, which followed the American Hernia Guidelines and then followed the British Hernia Guidelines. So, yeah. You should know, Alan, you wrote edit, the paper. Edit this one out. <laughs> no. Uh, you wrote the paper, Alan. <laughs> so, as per the guidelines, uh, you, this patient would qualify for a hernia repair. Okay. So, you're going to do some investigations. It's usually work up towards uh, so the patient going... For this surgery. patient, for this patient, I wouldn't need to investigate the hernia itself. Nope. It's obvious clinically uh, that's the hernia impacting his quality of life. 
So routine uh, CT scan or ultrasound scan, if you clinically can feel it, it's not really I would not recommend the routine CT scan. I would recommend a dynamic scan. So if they perform dynamic CTs in your practice, that'd be great to tell us where you work. But <laughs> dynamic ultrasound would be the way forward if you want to confirm it. Okay, uh, so we have investigation-wise, routine blood test, ECG, and pre-assessment, fine. We're going to move on to the operative management, presuming the patient has been counseled and wants operative management. What are you going to tell the patient that the, the operative management? Are? So this is where it becomes a bit more open for interpretation. You have you offer you counsel the patient for various ways of treating the hernia, open or laparoscopic. Uh, current national guidelines from NICE suggest that you can you are advised to offer laparoscopic in the first instance if you are happy as a surgeon to provide that service or if your unit offers it routinely among a higher number of patients that does not impact patients' wait waiting uh, time. Uh, guys don't say all that, but that would be best practice. Uh, but, uh, and you should be able to cover and explain to the examiners why the benefit for open versus laparoscopic or laparoscopic versus open. So if I would offer a patient, I would offer, me personally would offer open at this point in my practice. The reason for that is I'm more, I've done more numbers. I am more confident in doing it. And, uh, it's more likely that the patient will have their operation sooner if they want an open operation or a laparoscopic operation as the patient, as, as the, from a pragmatic point of view, the patient will be pulled and more surgeons will be able to offer them. Excellent. Okay, so you've got, you've got various options. You've got open versus laparoscopic, uh, and laparoscopic can then be subdivided into TEP or TAP, but we'll talk a little bit about that later. It is perfectly acceptable to say, I'm comfortable, and you've got to use the first person again. I, in my practice, my, I'm most, most comfortable with offering an open inguinal hernia repair, because that's what I'm used to. That's my practice. All my units practice is to offer laparoscopic. That's fine. And then you you want to tell them what your reasoning for that is. And it's perfectly permissible to say that's where your training is. So you're going to do an open uh, repair. According to the guidelines, though, where, when when is there are some instances where you may want to do laparoscopic. What are those, Matt? Correct. So in females, uh, because you have a better chance of covering potential or undetected femoral hernias as well, and you're basically covering that side and you forget about it, for patients with bilateral and guinal hernias, and for younger male patients where they are likely less likely to develop chronic pain following an open up for open inguinal hernia pair of mesh so laparoscopic has a less has a better chance of avoiding chronic pain as a side as a complication excellent okay so the instances where the guidelines say maybe laparoscopic is slightly better than open is in bilateral if you have bilateral hernias which i know is not in this scenario but that'll be one indication or this is a recurrence and the patient has previously had an open repair okay. In female patients, because there's there's a possibility of a concurrent femoral, even sometimes very rarely an obturator hernia, and there is some evidence that laparoscopic repairs offer better or a reduced rate of pain, uh, chronic pain in patients, although there is some contention around that. Okay, fine. Let's say the patient uh, wants to have an open repair and is been to pre-assessment, is medically fit for that, how would you consent them? What are you going to tell them? So I'd explain to the patient, so I need to say stopping so, stop saying so, I'd consent. The, the, so has been edited out about 25 times, by the way. The patient would be consented for an open inguinal hernia pair with mesh. I'd explain the mesh is important as it plays a, a, a main role of solidifying the body's uh, tissues against developing a, a new hernia. Explain to the patient that the presence of mesh stimulate, um, provokes the body in generating a scaffolding type firm tissue around where the hernia used to be, and that stops the, mesh, the hernia from coming back. That being said, there's still about a 3% risk, 3 in 100 risk of the hernia coming back. There's also about 10% risk of developing pain um, that lasts from up to two years that needs medication around the side of the hernia where we operated on. There's always a very small risk of developing an infection. Uh, or more more common but less serious, developing pockets of fluid or blood around where the operation took place. Overnight, it's usually a day case procedure where they come in if they're healthy around apart from the operation, they can go home on the same day. But there are sometimes risk of being admitted into hospital for uh, urinary retention in the catheter uh, or for other problems reg regarding to the anesthetic. And in my practice, all patients get a low molecular weight heparin if they're going to have an anesthetic and a, a major and a moderate procedure. Excellent. So to just summarize what Mo has said, 
You can tell the patient what it, in, it involves, and Mo's done that very nicely. But ultimately, when a patient asks about the risks and complications, or rather when you off, when you go through the consent form with them, and we should all be consenting patients in clinic rather than on the day, uh, uh, what you're going to say is this. There are, the risks are of the operation are either risks that we have from any surgery, and that's the kind of big four or five, which is anesthetic infection, bleeding, cardiorespiratory complications, DVT and pulmonary embolism and, and, and pain. Yes. A scar, although some people would argue a scar is not a complication. You don't have to make a scar. But they, they're the ones of any op, uh, of any operation. So have those listed. You should see them on a screen somewhere. Uh, our, our expert IT guy is going to do that for us. But there's also then risks specific to the surgery. And the specific to the surgery are recurrence and different rates are being quoted in different papers, anything between 1% and 5%, 3 being about the average percentage that's quoted. Need for removal of mesh if they have an ongoing seroma or infection. Chronic pain, which can happen in up to 10% of patients in open surgery, but again, this is contentious and different papers quote different figures. In men, in particular, especially older men with prostate problems, having groin surgery can mean they're going to urine retention after general anesthetic, especially with general anesthetic, and they may need to stay in overnight. But usually you can do this day case. And very rarely injury to other structures. That's the other thing. Injury to cord structures, so spermatic cord uh, and vas. Now, that may lead to testicular atrophy on that side, so you may need to warn them about that. And recurrent hernias are complicated. You may have to even consent them for a possible... Orchidectomy. Orchidectomy, although that thankfully happens quite rarely from, mm. from, what I, from what I know. Okay, so we've consented the patient. The patient has signed the consent form and is ready to go. Should we do techniques separately? I think it would be too much. Leave one go. Yeah, let's leave for next time. Let's do it possible.